This question this morning, what should I do with my doubts, is a great question because all of us struggle with doubt. All of us uh, have issues of faith and we have uh, questions about what we ultimately believe and how it all works. And very appropriately, what we're going to do this morning is actually return to the scene of Jesus' resurrection But this time, we're going to look at John's account of that scene. So I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to read from John chapter 20, the Gospel of John chapter 20, and we're going to read the first 18 verses together. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we spend some moments now again visiting the scene of the resurrection, I pray, Lord, that you would speak words that indeed are living and active, that penetrate our hearts, that touch the deepest parts of us. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, your servant, as you've given me these words this week. May I speak them boldly, and may you indeed speak powerfully through them, to us. Lord, you promised that your Holy Spirit would guide us into what is true and that the truth would set us free. And so we ask that in these moments, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, let's uh, use three headings to guide us this morning. Let's use these headings. Understanding our doubts, understanding our faith, and moving from doubt to faith. All right? Understanding our doubts, understanding our faith. And, And lastly, let's look at how we make that move from doubt to faith. Now, as I already mentioned, uh, doubt is common to all of us. 
We've all experienced doubt at one point or another in our life or are wrestling with doubts of some kind right now. All of us have doubts. Well, there's, all things we, there's things we wonder about, things that we uh, don't feel sure about, things we're curious about. And if we're going to get a deeper understanding of who Jesus is, we have to confront and work through our doubts. That's the only way we get into a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. We have to travel through the hallway of doubt to get to faith. There's just no other way. You've got to go through the hallway of doubt. Now, you and I, all of us, have gone through seasons of faith and seasons of doubt. There are times in the Christian life when God uh, feels so real and he feels so close and the joy of knowing him and the hope of uncertainty of his promises that he makes to us are, are so very real. We have such a sense of that upon our hearts. But then there's seasons when God feels very distant or he feels completely absent and we doubt whether he's real, we doubt whether anything the Bible says is really true at all. But regardless of what your particular question or set of questions is, you have to come to grips with your doubts and you have to learn how to, to overcome them and what John gives us here in this passage is a case study of faith and doubt. And he shows us two different responses to the empty tomb. And the first response is that of uh, Mary Magdalene. Now it says in verse 2, uh, she comes to the tomb, she finds it empty, and then she says this when she goes running back to Peter and John. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. His body's gone. Now what happened here? Mary is presented with physical evidence, an empty tomb. And she comes to a conclusion, and here's the conclusion she draws. Grave robbing. Grave robbing. Somebody stolen the body. And that was not, in those days, an unreasonable conclusion to draw because we know from history that grave robbing was a serious problem in the Roman Empire, and that it was actually considered a capital offense. Uh, if you were caught doing it, you could be, you could be put to death. That's how, that's how much of a problem it was. But now John comes to the tomb, and in verse 8, it says, he went inside, and he saw, and he believed. John is presented with the exact same evidence, same physical evidence as, as Mary, an empty tomb, and he draw, draws a very different conclusion. His conclusion is resurrection. Jesus is alive. Was John merely an optimist and Mary merely a pessimist? Well, Maybe they were indeed an optimist and pessimist, but I don't, I don't think it's that simple. See, Mary and John drew different conclusions because of certain faith assumptions they held. There were certain faith assumptions they held. Mary concluded that somebody had stolen Jesus' body because her assumption was resurrection wasn't possible. It hadn't happened. Jesus hadn't walked out of the tomb. Somebody stole the body. That's her faith assumption. Now, John, on the other hand, has the opposite conclusion. His conclusion is Jesus is alive. Jesus walked out. Even though he didn't understand everything that that meant, that was his conclusion. And when you and I come to our doubts, here's what we need to understand. We need to understand that beneath them lies something. Beneath our doubts is actually faith. Well, now, what do I mean by that? Beneath our doubts is an alternate set of beliefs and assumptions that we cannot prove any more than the, uh, the ones and beliefs that we've rejected. All doubt is a type of faith. It's an underlying faith system. The only reason that we doubt certain beliefs is because we hold other beliefs, beliefs that we can't ultimately prove are true, but we hold to be true. 
nonetheless. In other words, even our doubts are a leap of faith, friends. Even our doubts are a leap of faith. We shouldn't take our doubts at face value. Beneath your doubt are beliefs that you hold based on certain faith assumptions. You can't necessarily prove them, but you hold them. So it's not a question of whether some of us have faith and others of us don't. All of us are basing our our beliefs on some kind of faith, some leap of faith that we can't ultimately prove. So how do we overcome these doubts? Uh, how, do we, how do we get past them? And the answer is you don't have to just understand your doubts. You have to understand your faith. What does it mean to have faith? Well, in a, in a general sense, faith is this. Faith is entrusting yourself to something or to someone, entrusting yourself. And whatever you entrust yourself to and put your faith in is not neutral because you're looking to it for some kind of direction. Wherever you have landed in regards to what you believe about God, what you believe about the world, that is setting your heart on some kind of course. It's directing you in some kind of specific direction. You are making decisions and choices based on what you believe, based on your faith, based on whatever you have entrusted yourself to. Faith is not an abstract thing, all right? It is the compass of your soul because what you ultimately believe is going to determine the choices that you make. Faith, it's not neutral in this sense. Every single one of us is allowing our heart to be compassed by something. And therefore, what matters is not ultimately how strong or how weak your faith is, but the object of your faith and what you're putting your faith in. Let me give you an illustration here. Um, So you are running away from a grizzly bear and you come to a cliff. You come to the edge of a cliff, and the grizzly bear is coming, is bearing down on you. And you only have, you have two choices, basically. You're going to be eaten by the grizzly bear, or you can jump and grab onto a branch on the cliff, all right? These are basically the choices, all right? Because it's my illustration. I get to say what the choices are. Uh, Some of you are thinking, oh, no, I'm thinking of a third choice. Just work with me here. You can jump off the cliff, but, well, you do actually have another choice, and that is which branch you're going to grab onto, okay? Now, if you jump off and you grab a branch that is well-rooted in the side of the cliff, guess what? You're going to be saved. But if you grab a branch that isn't strong enough or isn't well-rooted, what's going to happen? It's going to snap off. See, what saves you is not the strength of your jump, It's which branch you grab onto. It's it's the object of your faith that saves you. It's not the strength of your faith. It's not the strength of your leap. It's what you grab onto. It's which branch you're going to grab onto. That's what matters more than anything else. And we've all made faith assumptions about ultimate reality, about who God is, about how we should live, It's impossible not to make these assumptions. Every one of us lands somewhere. Every one of us has entrusted ourselves to something. In other words, we're all holding on to a branch. Every single one of us, in this sense, has jumped off the cliff and has grabbed on to something. And this branch may be our family. This branch may be our spouse. This branch may be our career. This branch may be our money. This branch may be our possessions. It may be our social status. It can be anything. It may be Jesus. But it's something. You are holding on to something. I am holding on to something. We have to put our faith in something. In this sense, none of us is actually on the edge of the cliff. 
in this sense of the illustration. We've all jumped off and grabbed onto something. We're all hanging onto something. And let's look again at Mary for a moment. See, when the angel asks her, why are you crying? You know, why are you crying? She says, they have taken my Lord away. They have taken my Lord. Mary had put all of her hopes in Jesus. She had put all of her dreams and all of her hopes for her life and for her future into Jesus, that he was the Messiah, that he was the one who had come to redeem Israel, that, that he was the one who was going to finally rise up and defeat the oppressors, the Romans, and they would be a free nation again, and that he, God's kingdom would be established. All of her hopes and dreams had been put in him, but guess what? He was dead. And it was like the branch was snapping off in her hand. She was, she, she was so disoriented and so devastated, she didn't know what to do. And like Mary, we are all looking to something as Lord of our life, something that we're holding on to, some branch. And unless that branch is Jesus, the Bible is saying sooner or later it's going to snap off. Sooner or later it's going to snap off. Mary thinks her branch has snapped off until she meets the risen Jesus. And that's when she realized, no, she actually she's grabbed onto the right branch. But up until this moment, it's like the branch is snapping off. And there's three things that we've got in this passage that, about what Christian faith is. Three things that John shows us. And first of all, here's the first one, all right? Christian faith is impossible. Some of you are saying, what? Did the pastor just say Christian faith is impossible? Yes. And here's what I mean. Look at Mary. Mary is proof that believing in the person and work of Jesus does not come naturally to anybody. She had heard as often as anybody else, as often as any of the other disciples, she had heard Jesus say, I will die and I will rise again. But notice, we talked about this last week, she is not coming to the tomb expecting a resurrection. She's not expecting it empty. But when she comes, and so when she comes, she sees the empty tomb and she assumes grave robbing. She's staring right at it. She's staring right at the empty tomb, but she can't see it. She can't see the truth. It's staring her right in the face. Jesus even comes, and it says he's standing right there. She turns, and Jesus is right there. The resurrected Christ is right there, and she can't see him. And this means we cannot produce saving faith in Jesus by our own ability. Every single one of us is suffering from spiritual blindness that keeps us from having faith in Jesus. Jesus is again and again and again saying this, that we're blind, we can't see the truth on our own, we can't connect the dots on our own of the gospel. We need outside intervention. We need help. We need Jesus to help us. We need him to open our eyes so that we can see the truth. We need him to initiate the moment. He initiates the moment with Mary. He appears to her. He calls her name. He comes to her to help her have faith. That's the whole reason why he's making this appearance. He wants Mary to believe and he comes to her. Jesus knows Mary is never going to turn and trust him on her own, and he knows that you and I are never going to turn and trust him on our own, and that's why Christian faith is impossible. It's impossible for us to make the turn. It's impossible for us to see the risen Jesus without him revealing himself. Mary needed Jesus to open her eyes, and he did. See, our journey, friends, to faith always begins, number one, with this, admitting that we're spiritually blind. You have to admit that you're on the outside looking in. You have to admit that you don't see. You have to, you have to start there. Jesus says the only way to get into the kingdom is you have to be born again. You have to start over. That's what he's trying to tell Nicodemus in John 3. He's saying all your hard work to be good 
it doesn't, it's not paying off. It doesn't work. You have to admit that you're on the outside, that you're blind, that you don't see. So that's where we start. That's the first step. Now, the next step is to ask Jesus for help in order to have faith. So you have to admit you're blind, but then you've got to ask him to help you see. Uh, Tim Keller uh, says this in his one book, Encounters with Jesus. He says, if you're concerned about finding faith in Jesus, that might be a sign that he is already helping you get there. If some of you find yourself in that boat today, that maybe you're here and you're, you're wanting to believe in Jesus, but you're not sure that you do believe in Jesus, or you're not sure all that that means, you're not sure if you would call yourself a Christian, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're curious, the fact that you even want to have faith in Jesus is itself a sign that Jesus is helping you get there. It's a sign that something is happening. So admit you need Jesus' help and then ask him for help. But here's the second thing we need to understand about Christian faith. Christian faith is rational. Uh, it's more than being rational, but it's certainly not less than being rational. Faith is based on evidence. It's a response to being presented with certain evidence and drawing certain conclusions. In other words, it's not just a matter of the heart, it's a matter of the head as well. It's not just about feelings, it's not just about experience, it's about the, the intellectual aspect. We are physical beings, but we are intellectual beings and we are spiritual beings, which means that Christian faith encompasses all of those things. It's as much a matter of your, your mind as it is a matter of your heart. And this is one of the big criticisms often um, that secular people make of Christianity. They try to say, no, it's just all about blind faith and, and, uh, and you people aren't intelligent, you know, and you don't think. But the Bible is actually saying the exact opposite. And here's why. It's important to notice something that the disciples were not camped out at the tomb. None of them were there going, it's almost Sunday, <laughs> you know? They were not anticipating this. They were together, devastated, trying to figure out what this meant. And actually, it says when Peter showed up, in John's account, when Peter shows up at the tomb, the Greek word that's used when he sees the empty tomb is, 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 is blepo, B-L-E-P-O. And it means to process, to think. He gets to the tomb and he sees the strips of linen and Peter Blepoed. He, he, he stood there and he thought, and he's trying to figure this out, going, how, how is this possible? What does this mean? Where's the body? I don't understand. And it took multiple sightings. You know, we have multiple sightings in the Gospels where the disciples had to see Jesus several times and interact with him several times before they actually believed he really was resurrected and we read in last week's account when Jesus meets them on the mountain in Galilee and gives them the Great Commission, it says some of them still doubted. They still were trying to come to grips with this going, how is this possible? Like, what does this all mean? We tend to think that ancient people, oh, they were more superstitious back then. So, you know, it was a lot easier for them to believe in resurrection than it is for us, you know, us modern people today who just know better that people don't rise from the dead. You know, it was just as difficult for the disciples to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead as it is for us. They needed evidence. They needed intellectually credible evidence in front of them to believe. It wasn't just a matter of their heart. It was a matter of their head. You can't get to Christian faith without using reason, and it's meant to be that way. Faith isn't abandoning reason. It's a response to reason. It's a response to the facts. Your mind has to be committed just as much as your heart. It's about drawing certain conclusions based on the evidence. And in fact, the great thing is that in Christian faith, compelling evidence, such as the, the stuff we have in, in these Gospels, boosts our Christian faith. 
it actually strengthens it because we start to realize that what we are trusting in is not just hocus pocus. It's not just, you know, wishful thinking. It's not just, you know, um, just hoping that there's some kind of happy ending, but that something happened, that the tomb was empty that morning. And the last people who would have believed that Jesus was raised from the dead would have been first century Jews. But you have this band of uneducated men and women somehow just change the world all of a sudden because they believed something. Friends, they did not make this up. They were convinced he was, he was risen from the dead. Uh, just one more thought that Tim Keller gives that I think is very helpful to us. He says... Christian faith says, don't believe Christianity because it's exciting and practical and relevant. Believe it because it's true. Because if it's not true, in the end, it won't be practical or relevant. There will come moments in your life, friends, and you, I'm sure you can attest to these moments. I don't need to, to, to tell you, really, but I I'm, am I'm, I'm anyways. That in your life, there are moments when Christianity si- seems neither practical nor relevant. There are times when you go, I don't see what this has to do with my life. I don't understand, like, where are the answers here? There are times when the Bible calls you to do something that seems completely counterintuitive, completely against your instincts, against everything that your, even your feelings are telling you. And it's going to call you to, ma- to maintain certain beliefs and certain behaviors in certain circumstances and, circ- and situations that you find so challenging. Only if you trust that it's true, despite how you feel, will you be able to work through hardship and suffering and difficulty with your mind and your heart still intact. It's the only way. So Christian faith is impossible. Christian faith is rational. But lastly, Christian faith is relational. The moment everything changes for Mary is the moment when Jesus says her name. Did you notice that? That's the moment everything changes is when Jesus says her name. Jesus got personal with Mary. And friends, this is so, so, so important. Christian faith is not about adopting a set of propositions about what we believe about God. It's not just checking off a list saying, I believe in this, these doctrines. That's not what it is. Although that comes with it, that's not primarily what it's about. Christian faith is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's having a relationship with him. And for the person who says, how do you have a, a, a relationship with a 2,000-year-old dead guy? The answer is, because he's not dead. See, that's, that's the crux. That's why everything hang, hangs on the resurrection. The only way you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ is, guess what? If he's alive. And if the tomb's empty and he's alive, that's a game changer. But it's possible that you can have faith intellectually in the resurrection. You can believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and not actually know Jesus. Did you know that? You can believe intellectually. You can say, yeah, I believe he was risen from the dead and not actually be a Christian because to be a Christian is to know Jesus personally. It's to have a relationship with him. Look at John. Uh, In verse eight, it says he saw and he believed, but it hadn't become personal for him yet. And you know how we know that? Because of this little verse right here, the next verse in brackets. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So John sees the evidence. He concludes, he he believed that Jesus was alive, but he had no sense of what it meant, and he had no sense of that personally yet. Implicit in this verse is this, that they did not understand why Jesus had to die. If they didn't yet understand why he had to rise from the dead, it means they didn't understand why he had to die. It's not enough to simply believe that Jesus Christ died for other people in general. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died for you. You have to see that. You have to see that on the cross, he was taking your sin upon himself. 
my sin. And see, until it gets personal, he's just a man hanging on a cross. But when you see that he's hanging there because he's taking the debt of your sin on, he's, he is laying down his life to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, until you, oh, there goes that. Until you realize, until that becomes personal to you, the penny hasn't dropped yet. Friends, do you understand that Jesus Christ died for you? Do you know that? As the song that we sang on Good Friday, How Deep the Father's Love, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. This I know with all my strength, I think, or something. I know that it is finished. Friends, as it got personal for you, you have to admit that your sin is the cause of your spiritual blindness. The reason you don't see is because of your sin. And until that mask is taken away, you won't see Jesus Christ went to the cross to remove our blinders. If the gospel hasn't got personal for you yet, you don't have saving faith. And you don't have faith that will sustain you when the storms of life hit and start to batter you. Your house will crash. Our faith is not in something, it's in someone. The question is not what is the meaning of life, the question is who is the meaning of life? And do you know him? Not do you know some magical intellectual ingredient that gets you into an, a different enlightened category. Do you know the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ? Do you know him? He's someone who conquered death. He's someone who paid the ransom for our sin. He's someone who loved us so much that he would endure the ultimate horror to get us back. That's how precious we were to him. Someone who invites you and I now into an intimate relationship with him for all eternity. That's the invitation. Have you heard him call your name? Have you heard him whisper your name? Have you heard that? He's calling you, friends, right now. Right now in this moment, he's calling you. Will you entrust yourself to him? Will you give yourself into his hands? Even though you don't understand everything, even if you still have doubts, will you give yourself to him and entrust yourself to him? I mean, who would you rather do that with than Jesus? Will you receive the grace that he offers you right now? Christian faith is impossible It's rational, but it's relational. It's based on knowing this person. So how do we begin to overcome our doubts? How do we move from doubt to faith? Well, let me give you five things when the doubts come that will help you. The first one is you have to examine your doubts. As we've already talked about, every doubt that you have about Jesus, every doubt you have about God, every doubt you have about anything the Bible says, all of those doubts are are based on belief in something else, some other kind of assumption you're making. And to examine your doubts is to examine what the root of of your doubt is, the faith underneath that. You need to understand what that is, and then you have to ask yourself, can this other alternate faith that I'm putting my stock in, can it sustain me not only through life but past the grave? Will this branch, in other words, snap off at some point? See, in the end, every, every good thing, all right? Let me give you the bad news, friends. Every single good thing in your life is gonna desert you when you die. Did you know that? You know why? Because when you die, guess what? You lose your family. You lose your spouse. You lose your wealth. You lose your possessions. You, everything, every good thing in your life, when you die, you're, you're cut off from. That's a sense in which death is final. You, you lose all those things. 
Some of you actually are experiencing kind of the flip side in that, in that maybe a loved one, someone that, that was so precious to you already has died, and you're experiencing the reality of feeling cut off from that person that you loved so much. But certainly, when you and I die one day, every good thing essentially deserts us. And that's the bad news. If your faith is in any of those things, guess what? Your, event of your branch is eventually going to snap. If it doesn't snap in this life, which may, for many people it does, it's very interesting to read that after the meltdown, uh, the economic meltdown back in uh, 2008, 2009, how many really, really wealthy people lost so much money in, the, in, the, in their stocks and everything. There was a number of high-profile people who took their own lives. What happened? Their branch snapped off. Complete despair took over. If you're holding on to anything else that is not Jesus, that branch is gonna snap off sooner or later. If it doesn't snap off in this life, it will snap off when you die, the moment you breathe your last breath. But here's the amazing thing. You see, this story is telling us that if your branch is Jesus, it'll never snap off. You can't lose him. See, this is what the resurrection means. Jesus shows up, Mary sees him, and she, she tries to cling to him. We talked about this a little bit last week. She tries to hold on to him, and Jesus says, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to my father yet. What's going on here? What is Mary trying to do? She is trying to say, oh my goodness, I thought I lost you, and I am never losing you again. She's trying to cling to him, and Jesus is saying, Mary, you are going to have me. I promise you, you will, never, you will never lose me, ever. But he says, the only way that's going to happen, Mary, is if I return to my Father, and if I come to you by the power of my Spirit, and I come and dwell in your heart, and then you will have me in an even greater way than you have me now. And then I'll always be with you. You'll never lose me. And my spirit in you will actually be the thing that sustains you and takes you through the grave and brings you through the other side. Mary, my branch is the one that'll never break. That's what the resurrection means. Jesus is the one branch that'll never break on you, friends, both in this life and the next. So you have to examine your doubts You've got to understand what your, the, the actual faith that you have that's beneath your doubt and realize that it can't sustain you. But secondly, we need to learn how to pray our doubts. See, so often our doubts are based, friends, on how we feel in any good, given moment. We're not feeling it. You ever come to church on a Sunday morning and you're just not feeling it? It's okay to admit some of you are feeling like you would dare not say, you know what, dare I say as the pastor some mornings, there's mornings I come here and I'm not feeling it. <laughs> and I gotta get up and I gotta preach. And I gotta preach in, in such a way that, you know, regardless of how I'm feeling in that moment, to show that I believe what I'm saying. See, there's moments when we're not feeling it and so often our doubts are based on our feelings and many of the Psalms actually are prayers of David where he's working through his feelings. And there's, you know, there are so many of them that basically start like this. Uh, where are you, God? I'd really appreciate it if you showed up. My enemies are winning. The people who mock you and the people who, who, uh, who are against you, who are enemies of you, who don't love you, and I'm here, Lord, and I love you, and I'm running in the wilderness and living in caves right now, and it would be really nice, God, if you showed up. The Psalms are great. You know why? Because they always end with praise. Even though the psalmist says everything he's feeling, he eventually says, but you are my salvation, and I will praise you. Even his translation, even though it doesn't make any sense to me right now, even though I'm not feeling it, God, I will put my faith in you. I will hold on to you as my branch. And we've got to commit to pray through our doubts and be honest about them. 
Friends, the reason is because feelings are always unreliable at best. Sometimes our feelings absolutely align with the truth, and other times we are so certain of something that something is true because of how we feel, and it's just not. We need more than feelings. So we need to examine our doubts, we need to pray our doubts, but we also need to discuss our doubts. You gotta get in community with other Christians. This one's just, just a quick short one here. We need the perspectives and wisdom of other Christian people to help us walk through times of uncertainty and doubt. We need their wisdom because what happens is when we go through difficult times or when you go through a time when God feels absence, you know what happens? The blinders start to come on again. And we start to get tunnel vision and all we see is the suffering in front of us or all we see is what we feel and we have a hard time seeing beyond that. We struggle to see God's love. We struggle to connect to the joy and the hope of the gospel, and the church helps us do that. We gotta get with other brothers and sisters in the Lord and work through our doubts, discuss them together, because there's lots of times people have insights and things we haven't thought of that suddenly, guess what, completely smash the very thing that we're so convinced is the case, and all of a sudden, somebody, even something simple somebody says, and you go, oh, I never thought about that. So discuss your doubts. Fourthly, we have to learn how to doubt our doubts. What do I mean by that? Well, oftentimes in life, our doubt is running on video and our faith is running on audio. Some of you who know me well, and this would be, uh, of course, my family who's here, uh, know that don't talk to me when I'm watching TV. You know? Or, the, or that if you try, it's a, like a lost cause. I'm sorry. I'm, listen, I'm confessing here. Okay? I have a problem. I get, uh, you know? When I get watching something, this is why you know, Jocelyn's told me when we go out together and then we go to a restaurant with televisions, I have to sit with my back to the TV. <laughs> because what happens is, the interaction stops and I'm sitting there and why? Because what's on video overpowers the audio of what she's saying. And this is what happens with our faith and our doubt. All right? Our faith ends up running on, on audio and our doubt starts to run on video. And we can't process it. And so what we need to learn how to do is to doubt our doubts and to, to get our faith back on video. See, people... Let me give you just a quick illustration of how this works. Peter is invited by Jesus to step out on the water. And he does. And for a few steps, he's doing great. Because his faith is on on video. But all of a sudden, guess what? He starts to see the waves kicking up. and And he feels the wind. And what happens? All of a sudden, the storm becomes video and his faith goes to audio and he starts to sink. The reality of the storm to sink him became greater than the reality of Jesus to sustain him. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is 100% trustworthy. We can absolutely trust Jesus. But here's the other thing. The Bible also says that um, you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. And the Bible also says that you should give at least a 10% of your income away to the work of the kingdom of God. At least. But we're faced with a choice in those moments. Of all the commands that scripture gives us, we have a choice. We're either going to trust Jesus, we're going to trust Jesus' sex ethic, we're going to trust Jesus' uh, words about how to relate to money and power and all those things, or we're going to trust our own instincts. We're going to make that decision. See, having faith in Jesus means trusting that he has our best interest in mind and that we're going to obey even when we don't feel like it. See, if you're waiting for things to feel right in order to to obey Jesus and put your trust in Jesus, guess what? You're never going to put your trust in Jesus. If you're you're waiting for it to feel right to give 10% of your income away to the work of God's kingdom, it's never going to feel right to give it away. You'll never get there. Faith is based on the truth despite how we feel. Faith is acting on what you know despite the circumstances of life. Don't be, friends, don't be so quick to move to skepticism. 
You have to learn to doubt your doubts. In the same way that we often doubt our faith, we gotta doubt our doubts. Don't take them at face value. But lastly, here's the real key to all of this, and that is you gotta rehearse the gospel. Now, what do I mean by that? Friends, what's your prayer life like? What's your Bible reading like? How much time do you spend in God's word? How much time do you spend seeking him in prayer, earnestly, honestly, in, a, in your brokenness, even in your confusion? What's your community life like with other Christians? How much interaction do you have with other Christians? If the only basis of your faith, friends, is an hour and a half on Sunday morning, you are gonna sink. You're gonna sink. We rehearse the gospel by gazing at the empty tomb over and over and over again. We struggle with doubt because the resurrection seems too good to be true. We, we hinted at this last week. We live in a world of shadows, the shadows of death, the shadows of suffering, the shadows of tragedy. It's very hard not to get caught up in the brokenness and the shadows of this world. It just, we're so easily sucked into living in those shadows. And we tend to believe that in the end, you know what this world tells us? In the end, every branch snaps. So just grab onto the one that means the most to you and just try to hold out. That's what our world tells us. In the end, every branch snaps. In the real world, the frog never becomes a prince. The frog's always a frog, right? In the real world, Cinderella never makes it to the ball. In the real world, the beauty never wakes up. Sorry, I've been watching more Once Upon a Time this week. The empty tomb seems too good to be true, it just, it seems to, but, but Jesus is not in the tomb. The branch didn't break. And we've got to rehearse the gospel story over and over and over again in our lives. We need to tell it to each other. That's why we get together and we celebrate and we have preaching and all these things to remind ourselves of what the truth is and that the branch you and I are holding on to is not going to snap. Jesus Christ walked out You have to believe that he's alive. You have to believe that he came out of the tomb and you have to believe this morning that he is calling your name. Have you heard him call your name? Friends, it's not the strength of your jump that saves you. And it may be that some of you are holding out on entrusting yourself to Jesus because you're just feeling like, I just don't feel like my jump is gonna be very strong. That has nothing to do with it. Just jump, grab onto the branch and see, let him prove, as we sang this morning, or and or and or, that he is the one branch who will not snap. Examine your doubts, pray your doubts, discuss your doubts, doubt your doubts, rehearse the gospel story, gaze at the tomb. Jesus Christ is alive. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning recognizing that we all have doubts. And maybe some of them are similar. Maybe underneath them all is the same thing. But the truth is we wrestle with different things. There are different things that we find hard to accept, hard to understand, things that would seem to shake our faith. But we recognize, Lord, that the tomb was empty and that there is all this compelling evidence that suggests indeed that you were alive, Jesus, that you are alive and that indeed you are the one branch that if we grab onto, no matter how weak our leap of faith is, will not snap off. Lord, I pray for the person here today who is struggling to, to really entrust themselves to you I pray that you'll help them see that even despite their doubts that you are trustworthy and that if they would just acknowledge their need for you, acknowledge their blindness, acknowledge that you right now are calling out their name and just just take that leap of faith that you will sustain them in every way, that over time you will help them understand, over time you will bring clarity and assurance to their heart. 
Lord, for those of us who do know you but are struggling with, with doubt still, I pray that you would help us to press into your heart today, that we would take more seriously our need to pray and to read scripture and to get together and talk about these things, that we might be indeed led into the truth that Jesus Christ is alive and that that makes all the difference. So we give you ourselves, God. Fill us with your hope and joy this morning, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.